Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm so thrilled to see so many of you here. Um, as the announcer told me, I I'm Luca Baggi. I am a machine learning engineer at Futura, and I'm also one of the organizers at Python Milano. More on that later. Today, I'm here to tell you and show you that Rust is easy. And just to make you a big spoiler, you just have to trust the compiler. That's all it takes. Maybe the most alert of you would say, but come on, Luca, you're a machine learning engineer. You just call dot fit dot predict on an XGBoost model. Then you just make a fast API to put in production. What kind of knowledge you have of Rust? How can you say it's easy? Well, you have undercovered the first lie I told you today. Rust isn't easy. But Rust has great tooling. And you know deep inside that you're envious because the Rust tooling is so great. Also, Rust has great docs. Rust has docs that are so good that learning Rust is way less frustrating. It's way less infuriating. The error messages are so nice that learning it is such a pleasure. Also, the docs are so good that you do not even have to read them. You do not even have to know a single line of Rust to start writing Rust. I know it because I did, because I do not know Rust. That's the second lie of today's, and I hope the last one. I do not know Rust, and today I'm going to do something really dangerous. I'm going to live demo taking a, a, a Python code and turning it into Rust code of a really simple example, of course. But we can show you, and I want to show you that together, or even alone, you do not even have to know Rust. You only have to know Python to build your first Rust function. Why so, you would ask. First, how so? Because the compiler is great. The tooling is great. And second of all, you will be asking, why should I learn Rust? I am a Python user. And I would say, yes, totally. Like, 99% of us, except like maintainer of projects such as Polars, wouldn't even have to know Rust anyway, anytime. And that's because um, you might be using it already inside libraries such as OrJSON or Polars or Ruff. And the maintainers build this project and take care of melding and binding Rust to Python. So none of us basically here will almost likely use Rust anytime soon. But still, I would argue that learning Python, quite the opposite of Rust, is easy in the sense that it is accessible. Yet, best practices, such as clean code, design patterns, do not call in-place operators on pandas, are not so straightforward to get at first. And once they stick, it's a bit harder to get rid of them once the, your code just works. If it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? The point is, uh, learning best practices is a bit trickier. It may be a little bit too easy, and too easy and a bit too hard to forget. And also, um, once you see them, like the way you can teach people about avoiding those best worst practices, is just tell them on the documentation, perhaps on the library. Do not call this function, or these are the possible values that this function can accept, or do not use in place operation. Uh, there you are for the deprecation warning. Um, but how do you enforce them? So this is maybe one being one of the thread, like the small threads that we as Python users walk anytime. And documentation is wonderful. We can somewhat version it, but it isn't always there to help us, to stop us. Nothing prevents us to use in-place operation on pandas, for example. And Rust, by being so verbose at times, so strict, so uh, low level, much lower level than Python in a certain way, um, forces you to pay attention to these details. And this is what Rust can teach us as Python user, to write better code from the ground up. And so now let's pick up the best editor. Sorry, guys, it's not VS Code. Uh, also, sorry for the uh, Emacs crowd, if anyone is here. Today, we will be using Vim to write your first Python, actually, your first Python function inside the Rust file, and then turning it into something else. How do we do that? So Rust is an amazing tooling ecosystem. So you can go to like Rustup and install this binary that is basically PyEnv, but is actually an official piece of the Rust Software Foundation. And then you use Rustup to install your first Rust version. You don't have to do this today. We can do it together, though. Um, I already used it. And then once you install Rust, you can use their package manager, because they have a built-in one, which is called Cargo. 
And then how do you do that? Then you say cargo, we just initialize a project. What happened here is that cargo created the folder structure for us. It created this cargo.toml file, and it created a source folder, a source directory, where our code will lie. So how do we do that? Well, we open any of them, and you say, OK, good, this is our function. We don't even have to look at it. This is our piece, bit of Rust code. It's a main.rs file. And while we're learning Rust today, I'm doing it with you together. I haven't tried this at home, and I really do hope that you will try this at home, too. So how do we learn Rust? Well, how would we learn Python? Let's just create a definition function. Actually, let's deactivate any other um, tips and tricks and all the niceties that our editor has to offer. So let's just stop this uh, Rust analyzer. Sorry, it's a bit tedious to work on this such a level of analyzer. There we go. We do not have any recommendation. Let's do something even more daring. Let's just stop uh, Copilot as well. OK, I know you're using it. OK, don't lie. There we go. This is like a plain editor. I just have some syntax, I just have some plugins, but this is like the most basic experience that you can have. Let's just create a Python function then called hello that takes in a name and just returns uh, a string, hello plus name. Let's just save this. And also, we can exit Vim. Guys, uh, this, this one was free. Huh? <laughs> and now, what do we go about this from there? Well, let's just say cargo run. It didn't work. No one is surprised, to be honest. OK, we just wrote a Python function in Rust. But see the error message compiling. The function error on that line, see the amazing error message, the ASCII R saying, there we go. We expected one of exclamation mark or column column. Help, help message. Do not even start to Google it. Do not even start to grok it. Just read the whole message. Help, write function instead of def to declare a function. Good. We are learning it, right? Let's just go back to our Rust and say, OK, we do not use def, we use fn. Great to know. Some errors come up because I have to deactivate any time the analyzer, whatever. Let's just go that again. We fix the error. We just compile the code again. We see a bunch of errors, but go through step by step and see how familiar and how nice they want to be to you. PyConit expected one of double column, at or pipe, found a closed bracket. Function, hello name, expected one of those signs. Note. Anonymous parameters are removed in 20 days, whatever. And then you see three possible helps. If this is a cell type, give it a parameter name. If this is a parameter name, give it a type. If this is a type, explicitly ignore the parameter name. Also, return times are denoted using the arrow, as in Python. And then expect the type found keyword return. OK, there is something we can work on. The, by far the easiest recommendation is well, let's just add a parameter type. Good. Do we know types in Rust? Of course we don't. We come from Python. But we can figure something out, I can guarantee you. So let's go back to our main.rust function. Um, we denote it with the column. So let's just say, OK, I'm using a string. Um, we also remember to use the arrow key. So we can use another string, because our function is supposed to return a string. Good. OK, are we done? Let's compile the code. Mm, not yet. At the very end of our code, our, at the very end of the declaration of our function, we find string double column. There is something where that Rust is not, the compiler is not expecting there. What is it? It's one of exclamation mark, open bracket, plus, double column, smaller than, where, or, opening bracket, the squarely brace. Perhaps something tells us that we cannot define function in Rust with indentation, as we would do in Python, and the semicolon. So let's just start using, for example, the uh, square bracket. So let's just add one here. Let's delete, oops. Delete this bit, delete this bit, paste it there. There we go. OK, let's go. What happens here now? A bit of stuff, but still Rust tells us something new. Hello, function, string, help, a struct with a similar name exists. Notice the capitalization, string. Pubstruct string is a similarly named struct defined here. But the type string with a small s is not there in a scope. So what does it tell you? Well, maybe you should be using string with a capital S. That's great. Let's do that. OK, 
Let's go on. We change the S with a capital S. We change this S with another capital S. There we go. OK, good, good, good. OK, I just compile the code. We get another error. We're getting used to that. We kind of have like, this weird pleasure of being rejected every time. And you see, OK, now there's a main function not found in this crate. Crate is the name of the library. OK, OK, I can do that. We can just add a function, call it main. It doesn't have to be a function that does anything. It just has to be there for, what, for what, as far as we are concerned. But see here, we cannot add a string to an ampersand string, which is called um, a string slice. OK, we cannot concatenate two things with different types. Nice. See how it tells you the error. The hello is a, a string slice, basically a vector of strings. Uh, of characters, and we're adding it with this plus operator that cannot be used to concatenate an ampersand string and a string. But see the beauty of it. There, down there, it is already telling you how to fix that. These to own, there's something to do with uh, um, borrow checking, all the stuff that I do not understand, but I know there is, and most of us do actually think. And then we should be adding another ampersand in front of name. Okay. Good, let's do that, Let return to owned, and then uh, we just prefix the ampersand, if I can find it on the keyboard, on this. We open, we run it again, oops, sorry, we compile it again. Okay, good, we're just finding one error, let's just do this on a higher portion of the screen. The main function is not found. Consider adding a main function. OK, the error with the string types and the compatibility is gone. Good. How do we do this? Well, just say function main and say we know that we have to use a, a, what is it called? As just a, um, a, semi, a squirrely braces to define it. We just do this. Uh, we just quit it. And then we go cargo run, compiling Python function. We get a warning because there is one unused function. There is a dead code somewhere in our code. And Rust is so nice that it tells us. But see, the code compiled. We just threw it in garbage, in a sense like outrageous Python code. And error by error, we improved it until we got a working Rust function. So um, I don't know if I can call that, because as I told you, I do not know Rust. But maybe, maybe we can just say hello. OK, no, maybe not. Uh, hello name? No, it doesn't work because it is a package. If we found like if we built a binary, it would have been different. But still, please appreciate how we went from a Python function inside the Rust file into a proper Rust function that in between taught you the very basics of Rust. More so, notice how good the compiler messages were. And notice that there are such great starters to get started with Rust on the communities. For example, the so-called Rust links, which are exercises to get started with Rust. These are great to get started. And I highly encourage you to going through them, as I would do. So do not read the docs. Just go head on, like smash on the wall, and find the compiler's error. Because what we are after, as Python users, is not learning Rust, perhaps but maybe finding new ways to write better code, which doesn't require borrow checking, but requires a couple of little bit of things of Rust that can teach us, that it can teach us. Better docs, uh, structs, like to denote types, type and types annotation. And this is so good that anyone, anyone in here has to try it. Because as I was telling you, writing Python code is so great, it's so natural, it is so accessible, it's so um, empowering. And this is what brought us here all together. I have a Master of Science in Economics and Statistics. Before that, I was doing a Bachelor in Philosophy. So uh, I got to data science uh, and doing like code like on a much lower level than I would have anticipated a couple of years ago, of course. And the kind of these good patterns are hard to get, hard to learn, but then you can Learn them anyway. You can go to other languages, other practices, and get from this um, confrontation with other people and the code they build and learn new things that you can use. For example, uh, let's just see an ex a concrete example of this. We have type ints in Python. They are wonderful. They're not main. They can be controversial. They can be trivial. But see, I would like to make an, a controversial claim, another one myself. So type ints are here to stay. And production-grade code should have type ints. 
Okay, most of us kind of agree, right? Who doesn't agree? Who doesn't use type ints in here? Exactly, so most of us do on a daily basis because we like the tooling, we like MyPy, we like rough, we like PyWrite, we like annotation in our editor when we write code. It is faster, it is much faster. But still, I would say that this example of a user class that can take in a privilege, which is a string, and possibly a daytime attribute because the user can be banned, is not so intuitive. We can improve on it a bit. For example, like so. We can add a literal type and say, OK, the privilege is either normal, admin, or banned. That's a really step up. Because otherwise, what would you have done? Maybe you would have had to write something in your doc string and say, OK, the user, the privilege type can only be normal, admin, or banned. It can, you would have had to implement uh, an if statement to check whether this code belongs in there. And you would have to do it anyway with the type checking, of course, because uh, Python is not, it, like the static checking is not enforced at runtime. But still, the final user would be using your library, your colleague, your, the future you, would have to remember that, would have to go through docs. Instead, if you use this notation, our editor will tell us, A, you can only use one of those three values. And this is a really step up, it's a nice improvement. But I would argue that we can go beyond that. And this is something that somewhat Rust, like going through Rust, or this kind of influence that the, the, the type in the community and the mind melding that we've had all together brought us to Python eventually, which is that date time or none. I hate when function return none because I have to treat them somewhere in the function. The point is that, oh yes, that can be none, okay, good. Now it's up to the final user to handle that case. Sometimes, okay, sometimes it's right to just return a non-value, but still, the point is, the end user has to work with that. How can we improve on that? Again, thinking about a bit of a rust way. Let's do it like this. See, you see the class band, we can define another one, and say that our user can also, can either be a literal, or can also be an instance of a class band. In this way, we do not have to have a daytime object inside our um, band at attribute. We do not even have to have that at all in a user class. And it because it will be like 99% empty most of the time, I would say, and you would, have that, and you would have to write it in the docs. You would have to warn everybody, remind everybody constantly that uh, band at would be none for most cases because user will not likely be banned, for example. And this is great because it enables us for example, if you're using a Python 3.10 match statement, but also like a, a regular if case, to check in a more thorough way and process our data in a more thorough way, for example, with this notation, we can say user.privilege, if that user privilege is an instance of a band attribute, of a band class, then we can just use that argument and print, for example, our business function logic cell that they will tell us that the user was banned at the time, so it is forbidden to log in in our portal, for example. Or if the user is an admin, do the admin stuff. Else, underscore, do whatever else you would do for regular users. Um, this is not, of course, this is all nothing new, of course. We've, we had this for a couple of years. Python has learned a lot from Rust. Uh, or Python has improved quite a lot besides Rust, anyway, because from 3.11 and in 3.12, we even better still, the error message will be more accurate. They will be highlighted in uh, our backtrace where the error matches originated from. The exception was raised. And this uh, match statement was precisely implemented. This is just a glorified if statement, OK? And there's nothing more than that. But that internally is used to provide that highlighting, for example, that we see in error stack traces right now. Um, I'm not here to say that Rust brought this to Python, of course. But I'm here to tell you that some of those tricks that uh, from some inspiration to improve our Python code, not only in standard libraries, but in the code you write for production, can draw, uh, can improve from uh, the inspiration and the exposition to other languages, even those that are more verbose, um, more new, uh, more uh, low level than what we used to. Because Rust Python is really beautiful, but still, uh, we can draw from that experience to enhance this uh, uh, structural, structural, these typing ideas, these typing feelings, the type annotation in Python, and use them in a much more thorough, complete, exhaustive manner. Rather than just annotating everything as a string and stringify our code, 
we can just be using the appropriate abstraction that Python offers us in so many circumstances to improve our code. For example, yesterday we had a beautiful talk on uh, in structural subtyping using protocols. That was an incredible uh, source of inspiration to use those anywhere in our code. Questions, anybody? Failure. Does anybody feel like doing another rustling, for example? Ah, I see here. What can we do? Should we improvise? I think the question is, so let me just wrap this up very quickly and then we do an exercise all together then and try something new more collectively. I would like to thank you. Um, <laughs> and I would like to take this couple of moments to tell you that uh, tomorrow, uh, this is, is this room again? Yes. I will be holding another talk on Polars, like a proper one on doing data analytics, supercharged, high-speed query plans, expressive syntax. And also, I would like to tell you uh, that if you please, I'm eager, I'm starving for feedback, so feel free to uh, tap, uh, connect with me, or send me an email with the feedback about this call and whatever you feel like, and feel free to connect, of course. So for the last, say, five minutes or so, if you want to try something new, we can pick up another example in Rust and do this in a really unexpected, like, improvised way and how we can use Rust to do something new. So, for example, let's just delete our function, let's just leave the main function here. Anybody, what do you want to try now? Adding numbers or appending to a list? Sorry? Factorials implementation, wow, okay, that's gonna be really hard, okay. So let's get back what we know, let's just say factorial of uh, A. Okay, no, 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 copilot, I don't want you here. So LSP, let's just say LSP stop. We just stop copilot because it doesn't even know Rust, so it's okay. Let's just get, let's get a number. We know that uh, uh, we can use the error type. We need to use the, okay, good. Okay, guys, we've learned in Rust, okay. Um, how do we use it? Number is a type int, and then uh, let's build an array. Uh, let's just say let, uh, um, numbers equal to, I don't know, let me say, range of number, and uh, see how this works. This is a, per, a best effort, like, for everybody else. Please feel free, but let's just go back to our cargo run. What does it tell us? A lot of stuff, it is expecting a return type. Guys, this is not Rust, this is just me being busy. Okay, good to know. What will it return? Of course, it will return an integer. I'm pretty confident that uh, um, it won't accept an integer because it would like to have something more like typed, strictly typed. Not found in this scope, this int object. Perhaps you intended to use i32. Okay, guys, this is bonkers. We, we tell, it told us the type that it wants to use. Great, great, let's go back to our Rust function then. And I just use some V magic, we percent actually, um, percent, comma percent s and let's just call int with int 32 there we go okay i'm i missed a g there slash g globally okay wow okay that's nice it is an it was an int it was just i 32 good to know it's also more concise good let's see what Rust tells us again Implicitly returns none, as its body has no tail or return expression good okay that one this like the empty tuple is called the unit, I think, and it tells you that uh, um, your function is better to return, so we should be returning something. But then again, let numbers is a range of number. Some errors have detailed explanation. Help, consider returning the local binding number. Okay, that was a sort of a nice, helpful recommendation. Let's go back to our function, and then just say, uh, I don't know, just return numbers to see if at least I can make an array in Rust. Okay, let's just go back to cargo run, and what will tell us? Range is not found in this scope, but we could use, you can say, you can improve, you can improve your code, you can import some stuff from the standard library and use it to import your code. Good to know, let's just bluntly copy, uh, maybe not, okay, this, this won't look nice, then we just import, use std, use std, uh, what is it called, like iter, slice, range, right? A range. Okay, r r r r range, okay. It, can, it can't help you with typing, okay. Oh, okay, range is a private module, really? This sounds weird, but still, cargo run, what will it tell us? The module range is defined here, 
um, the module range Rust is private. OK, let's just go. To, this doesn't exhaust us. Let's satisfy us. Let's just see Rust to see. Explain the E, what is it called? E0603. There we go. This is the man page that you get when you want to go deeper and when you're not advised. We're not even touch Stack Overflow, okay? We don't even touch ChatGPT, to be honest. <laughs> a private item was uh, used outside of his scope. See the examples. Module foo, constant private, you unsigned integer 32. This constant is private, so we cannot use it outside the foo module, etc. In order to fix this error, you need to make them item public by using the pub keyword. So in Rust, we learn right now that we, there is a differentiation between public and private attributes, or public and private items in our code. Shall we go on iterating, or do you have any questions that you want like to ask something? Or if you want to suggest something, because maybe some of you here inside here know Rust already, and you're just like a spies to go undercover. There we go, there's somebody in there. The unwrap thing. What do you mean? What do you mean by unwrapping? Okay, that's something. You, uh, now, how would you do that? <laughs> well, we can try that too, but I cannot guarantee it. So, uh, so would you like unwrap range of numbers? The point is we cannot use a range, so um, let's just delete this again, and then we create it, and then we say, Cargo, please help us. Uh, we, ah, it was slice, guys. Okay, somebody knew that in the back and kept them from me all this time. Okay, so let's just undo, and they say, slice. Maybe this would, can we pull one last trick? Can we? Well, 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 something changed, but, 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 okay, use of unstable library features lies range. Okay, maybe that was what you're referring to. Um, note, see this issue. Mm, okay, see another issue. Let number, the trait, the range bound uh, um, unsigned, um, um, unsigned size is not implemented for integer 32. We required by a bound to do by this call, and then we can see all the kind of messy stuff that we can start getting from there. Still, what we learn from Implementing factorials from scratch, I would argue, is that um, rather than being the next Rust god in the room, uh, we can learn from this kind of structure and how errors are raised and how to provide and guide your user through uh, problem solving and troubleshooting in your library. I would say that this is like very much a, a lovely attempt for all of us in four minutes. So uh, if you don't have any, any other further questions, I would like to thank you again for going through this journey with me. And maybe enjoy to try out, rather than the Rust altogether, just read through the typing page in Python and find new usage for stuff that you might want to use. Thank you again.